Shepherds are not highly thought of where I'm from because we spend a lot of time with the sheep. Well, we spend most of our time with sheep. And sheep are not the cleanest animals and they tend to not smell very good. And therefore, since we're with them all the time, we tend to not smell very good either. And a lot of people don't want to be around us because of that. Some don't like us because we're really the lowest servant class in the whole nation of Israel and, and Judea right now. But I mentioned that we're from Bethlehem. And that's important because the sheep that we watch and that we care for and that we help birth and take care of are the primary sheep that are used in temple sacrifices over in Jerusalem, not very far from here. Well, we also have the distinction of having the same occupation of one of our greatest kings. In fact, some think that King David was the greatest king in Israel. And before he was king, he was a shepherd just like us. It's a noble, but oft not very well received profession. I was out in the field. It was getting on toward evening and the sun had gone down and I was there with my older brother, whom I respect greatly. And we had two of our cousins with us. It was our night to be on watch, and we were with the sheep. The sheep were starting to settle down. Now, we as shepherds are prepared to defend the sheep against predators. Most of the predators are four-legged, and they, they like lamb. There are a few two-legged predators, however, that like to steal our sheep, and we try to guard them against that. But this night, something happened that uh, I'll never forget, but at the same time, it was unusual in many other ways. We're out getting settled down and we're discussing who's gonna take this area and that area and what we're going to do, and all of a sudden, the sky was filled with light, a blinding light, more powerful than the sun. And we all kind of froze, didn't know what to do. And then we heard a voice. The voice said, be not afraid. Okay, sounds good. For I am bringing you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Well, by this time, our eyes had adjusted and we could see the form of a man, but it couldn't be a man because he was hovering in the sky. Not, not on the ground, not, not, he was hovering in the sky. We figured it had to be an angel. And he continued to speak. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Okay, now we're, it's got our attention. And he finished saying that, and the sky was filled with angels. As far as the eye could see, from this side to that side, everywhere there were angels, and they spoke together. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. As the sound of their voices faded, so did the, the light. And we're now in darkness. We had to adjust our eyes. Samuel, my brother, said, let's go to Jerusalem and uh, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that we've been told about. And one of my cousins, Abijah, said, uh, what about the sheep? My brother looked at him and said, if God can do that, he can take care of these sheep. 
okay. So we went with haste. Now, we're shepherds. We knew everybody around Bethlehem. We were out in the, out in the country, but we knew where sheep were kept. And as we started toward Bethlehem, about a half hour journey, we stopped here and there was no savior there. There was no baby there. Stopped in another place, there was no baby there. And then we started, we got into the town. And one of us remembered that there was an innkeeper. And this innkeeper had a stable. So we went to him and he motioned to where the stable was. And we went out to the stable and we could see in the far corner of the stable, there were some people, a man and a woman, something was going on with her. And as we got close to the stable, the man met us. His name, his name was Joseph ben Jacob of the tribe of David. Wow. He said to us after we told him what we had seen, he said, come, come, come. He took us into the back of the stable and there, there, there was a baby. Mother, we're supposing, the only woman there attending to the child. He, hadn't, he, 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 he was barely a couple of hours old and resting after the ordeal of birth. We stood there and watched a little bit and conversed with the man. But it hit us and we realized this child, this child is the Messiah the long-promised Messiah. Now, remember, we have not heard from God since Malachi. We've not heard anything from God for 400 years. And now, we have in our very presence the Messiah of God. Wow. Well, we didn't stay very long. We didn't want to disturb what was going on. And we wanted the parents to rest as well as the baby. So we left. As we're going back out to our sheep, we're telling everybody we see what has happened. We're telling everybody we meet, some weren't real happy with us, we saw everybody we met, we told about this baby, that he's the Messiah of God. We returned to our sheep and took care of things that night. Well, time passed. We're in Bethlehem, but time has passed. And that child, that baby grew into a boy. We heard some rumors that he had been in the temple when he was 12, 13 years old. He'd been in the temple and was confounding the doctors and the, all the people there, and we kind of chuckled a little bit. And, and then we, we heard nothing about him for some yet time. It was a while later, and we heard about him again. His name was Jesus. He had become a teacher, a rabbi had a small following of men that went everywhere with him. And he went about doing good. He healed one lady's dead son while they're on their way to the funeral. Made blind Bartimaeus to see. Helped the cripple that was put in front of him by others. The man walked. He was doing all these great things and teaching things, and he got the attention of our religious and political leaders and they didn't like what they saw. Eventually they had him arrested. Then they had a trial. At the trial he was convicted, convicted of being the son of God. He was turned over to the Romans for crucifixion. We were doing well until we heard that and then he was crucified and we were all, we were all just didn't know what to do. He was the Messiah. He was, he was, and he was crucified, and now he's dead. We had such high hopes. We had such great longing in our heart, and now it's over. We were, we were really, really brought low. But wait, three days later on the first day of the week, we heard a rumor. Some women had seen him alive alive. It was reported by the women, then it was reported by some of his followers, then it was reported by others. And he was alive. And the last report we heard is that he had been taken up into heaven after he'd raised from the dead. Wow. 
That brightened our hearts. And we came to realize in that moment that he was not just the Messiah, but he was our Savior. And I trusted him. I trust him for eternal life. And you can too, if you'll just believe what you hear and the truth about him. Thank you. What was I supposed to do? They showed up in the middle of the night, tired, hungry, and the woman, boy, the woman was very pregnant. They wanted a room, said they'd been all over town, and we were their last hope. Ruth, my wife, came to the door while we were talking. She has such a big heart. That can be a problem for a businessman sometimes. They described their trip down from Nazareth to Bethlehem. A long journey in the best of circumstances. An interminable trip with a pregnant woman in crowded roads. When they were finished, I told them I was sorry. And I truly was but I had no place for them to stay. My house was full, had been for two days. Ruth, bless her heart, wanted to give them our room, but I put my foot down. Where were we going to stay? In the stable? No, I am a man of compassion, but that was taking things too far. But when I mentioned the stable, Ruth's eyes lit up. Why couldn't they stay in there, she asked. It would be out of the cold night air and they could at least get some rest, even if it wasn't the best of circumstances. Now, I have never housed a guest in my stable with the animals and the smells and the obvious inconveniences. I mean, I have a reputation to maintain as an innkeeper. But Ruth can be very convincing. So I consented. They seemed so grateful. And the arrangements didn't bother them at all. They were simple folk, not accustomed to finery. And the stable was no problem for them. So it was settled. They would stay with us for the night and try to find something else in the morning. We took them around back where the, we kept the animals in the cave. And it was full, but they managed to find a little spot in the back corner and carve out a place, pile up some hay for a makeshift bed. As we were helping them get settled, it appeared to Ruth and me that the young woman was very uncomfortable. Looked like she could have her baby at any moment. Another good reason we should not have housed them in our home. What a disaster that would have been. To have a woman have a baby in the middle of the night in the middle of a house full of guests. Once they were settled, we left them alone with the animals and went back inside to get some rest. After our guests were cared for, we retired for the night. But not for long. I was sound asleep, dreaming that I was working a merchant at the market. He became angry with me and started shaking me. Only it wasn't a merchant at all. It was Ruth. There's some commotion out at the stable, Joel, she said. I think that young girl is having her baby. Great, I thought. Why couldn't she have waited one more night? Get some water and meet me at the stable. I knew that was coming. By the time I arrived, I had already missed the blessed event. 
The young woman was busy washing and wrapping her newborn son. I handed her the water and she took it gratefully and finished the job. It appeared to me that she had everything well in hand. So I took Ruth's hand and we started to leave. Only she resisted. What is it about women and babies? We can see the baby in the morning, Ruth, I said. Let's leave them alone. Go back inside and get some rest. Before she could answer, there was more commotion. This time outside the stable. Some men had arrived looking for the baby. What? At this hour? It's the dark of night. What are these men doing wandering around Bethlehem looking for babies? I recognized them as shepherds from outside of town. They weren't the cream of the crop, if you know what I mean. They said they'd seen a vision of angels. And the vision told them to come into Bethlehem and look for a baby boy lying in a manger. They said the angels told them the little boy was the Messiah. The Messiah? In my stable? That was a little hard to swallow. But I had to admit, they had their information correct. Go into Bethlehem, look for a newborn baby boy, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. It wasn't likely that set of circumstances had been duplicated anywhere else in town. As they came in, the young couple didn't seem surprised by them at all and were more than happy to show them their newborn son. We stayed to be sure the men had no other motives. But after a little while, they left, and then so did we. But we didn't go back to sleep. Not that night. As we lay there, Ruth and I wondered, what did all of this mean? Who were these people? How did those shepherds know how to show up at our stable? Did they really see a vision of angels and the boy, the little baby lying in a manger in our stable. Was he really the Messiah? Christmas Day, 1914. Dear Mother, my darling Meg. My good friend Charles. My dear sister Janet. It is two in the morning and most of our men are asleep in their dugouts. Yet I could not sleep myself before writing to you of the wonderful events of Christmas Eve. In truth, what happened seems almost like a fairy tale and if I hadn't been through it myself, I would scarce believe it. Just imagine, while you and the family sang carols before the fire there in London, I did the same with enemy soldiers here on the battlefields of France. As I wrote before, there has been serious, little serious fighting of late. The first battles of the war left so many dead that both sides have held back until replacements could come from home. So we have mostly stayed in our trenches and waited. But what a terrible waiting it has been, knowing that at any moment an artillery shell might land and explode beside us in the trench, killing or maiming several men, and in daylight not daring to lift our heads above ground for fear of a sniper's bullet. And the rain, it has fallen almost daily. Of course, it collects right in our trenches where we must bail it out with pots and pans. And with the rain has come mud, a good foot or more deep. It splatters and cakes everything and constantly sucks at our boots. One new recruit got his feet stuck in it and then his hands too when he tried to get out. Just like that American story of the tar baby. Through all this, though, we couldn't help feeling curious about the German soldiers across the way. After all, they faced the same dangers we did and slogged around in the same muck. 
What's more, their first trench was only 50 yards from ours. Between us lay no man's land, bordered on both sides by barbed wire. Yet they were close enough, we sometimes heard their voices. Of course we hated them whenever they killed our friends. But other times we joked about them and almost felt we had something in common. And now it seems they felt the same. Just yesterday morning, Christmas Eve day, we had our first good freeze. Cold as we were, we welcomed it, because at least the mud froze solid. Everything was tinged white with frost, while a bright sun shone over all. Perfect Christmas weather. During the day, there was little shelling or rifle fire from either side, and as darkness fell on our Christmas Eve, the shooting stopped entirely. Our first complete silence in months. We hoped it might promise a peaceful holiday, but we didn't count on it. We'd been told the Germans might attack and try to catch us off guard. I went to the dugout to rest, and lying on my cot, I must have fallen asleep. All at once, my friend was shaking me awake, saying, Come and see! See what the Germans are doing! I grabbed my rifle, stumbled out into the trench, and stuck my head cautiously above the sandbags. I never hoped to see a stranger and more lovely sight. Clusters of tiny lights were shining all along the German line, left and right as far as the eye could see. What is it? I asked in bewilderment, and someone answers, it's Christmas trees. And so it was. The Germans had placed Christmas trees in front of their trenches lit by candle or lantern, like beacons of goodwill. And then we heard their voices raised in song. Stilig Nacht, Heilig Nacht. This carol may not yet be familiar to us in Britain, but one soldier knew it and translated, Silent Night, Holy Night. I've never heard one lovelier or more meaningful in that quiet, clear night. It's soft, it's dark softened by a first quarter moon. When the song had finished, the men in our trenches applauded. Yes, British soldiers applauding Germans. Then one of our own men started singing, and we all joined in. The first Noel, the angel did say. In truth, we sounded not nearly as good as the Germans with all of their fine harmonies. But they responded with enthusiastic applause of their own, and then they began another. O oh, Tannenbaum, O oh, Tannenbaum. Then we replied, O oh, come all ye faithful. But this time they joined in, singing the words in Latin, Adeste Fidelis. British and German soldiers harmonizing across no man's land. I would have thought nothing could be more amazing, but what came next was more so. English, come over, we heard one of them shout. You no shoot, we no shoot. There in the trenches, we looked at each other in bewilderment. Then one of us shouted jokingly, you come over here. To our astonishment, we saw two figures rise from the trench, climb over the barbed wire, and advance unprotected across no man's land. One of them called, send officer to talk. I saw one of our men lift his rifle to the ready, and no doubt many others did the same. But our captain called out, hold your fire. Then he climbed out and went to meet the Germans halfway. We heard them talking, and a few minutes later, the captain came back with a German cigar in his mouth. We've agreed. There will be no shooting before midnight tomorrow, he announced. But sentries are to remain on duty, and the rest of you, stay alert. Across the way, we could make out groups of two or three men start, starting out of the trenches and coming towards us. Then some of us were climbing out, too, and in minutes more... Though we were in no man's land, over a hundred soldiers and officers of each side, shaking hands with men we'd been trying to kill just hours earlier. Before long, a bonfire was built, and around it we mingled, British khaki and German gray. I must say, though, the Germans were better dressed. They had fresh uniforms for the holiday. Only a couple of our men knew German, but more of the Germans knew English. I asked one of them why that was. Because we have worked in England, he said. Before all this, I was a waiter at the Hotel Cecile. Perhaps I waited on your table. Perhaps you did, I said, laughing. One German told me he had a girlfriend in London and that the war had interrupted their plans for marriage. I said, don't worry, we'll have you beat by Easter, and then you can come back and marry the girl. He laughed at that. And then he asked if I'd send her a postcard he'd give me later, and I promised I would. Another German had been a porter at Victoria Station. 
He showed me a picture of his family back in Munich. His eldest sister was so lovely. I told him I should like to meet her someday. He beamed and said he would like that very much and gave me his family's address. Even those who could not converse could still exchange gifts. We gave them our cigarettes and they gave us cigars, our tea for their coffee. We gave them corned beef and they gave us sausage. Badges and buttons from uniforms changed owners. And one of our lads even walked off with the infamous spiked helmet. I myself traded a jackknife for a leather equipment belt, a fine souvenir to show when I get home. Newspapers too changed hands and the Germans howled with laughter at ours. They assured us that France was finished and Russia was nearly beaten too. We told them that was nonsense and, none of them, and one of them said, well, you believe your newspapers and we'll believe ours. Clearly, they have been lied to. Yet after meeting these men, I wonder how truthful our own newspapers have been. These are not the savage barbarians we've read so much about. They are men with homes and families, hopes and fears, principles, and yes, love of country. In other words, men like ourselves. Why are we led to believe otherwise? As it grew late, a few more songs were traded around the fire. And then we all joined in for, and I'm not lying to you here, Old Lang Syne. Then we parted with promises to meet again tomorrow. And even some talk of a football match. I was just starting back to the trenches when an older G German clutched my arm. My God, he said, why cannot we have peace and I'll go home? I told him gently, that you must ask your emperor. He looked at me then searchingly, perhaps my friend, but also we must ask our hearts. And so dear mother, dear wife, dear friend, Dear sister, tell me, has there ever been such a Christmas Eve in all of history? And what does it all mean, this impossible befriending of enemies? For the fighting here, of course it means regrettably little. Decent fellows those soldiers may be, but they follow orders and we do the same. Besides, we are here to stop their army and send it home, and we could never shirk that duty. Still. One cannot help imagine what would happen if the spirit shown here were caught by the nations of the world. Of course, disputes must always arise. But what if our leaders were to offer well wishes in place of warnings? Songs in place of slurs. Giving of presents in place of reprisals. Would not all war end at once? All nations say they want peace. Yet on this Christmas morning, I wonder if we want it quite enough. Yours truly. Yours always. Sincerely. With all my love. John. Andrew. Philip. Tom. The Reader's Theater that you just observed is based on a real event. The Christmas Truce of 1914 was an event between the German and the British soldiers where fighting stopped. And between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, instead of fighting, they were brothers, or at least they were friends for a few moments during the Christmas season. And there was peace on the battlefield. Now, unfortunately, what happens in, in many uh, situations today is that we look at that peace on the battlefield and we think that's what the angel was promising. But that's not what the angel said. What he said was, peace on earth to men with whom God is pleased. So the concept of peace is a peace between us and God, not a peace between the nations. The nations, scripture tells us, the nations will continue to fight and wars will become worse and worse as time goes on, not better and better. So the peace that we're talking about is a peace between us and God, a peace that does not, that, that, that defies comprehension, passes human understanding. And it's that peace that we wish for you at Christmas. We trust the Lord will use this to encourage you, uh, to uh, delight you with some dramatic presentations, both ancient and modern, and will help you to understand just a little bit better the Christmas season and the Christ who came to die for our sins and give us peace. The Lord bless you. Merry Christmas. Thank you.